Thank you for having me. I'm happy today to talk with you about the global burden of long COVID that we have worked on the past several years now. So in our work, our funding is from Gates Foundation, um, no other funding or conflicts of interest. It became clear early in 2020 that a portion of patients infected with SARS-CoV-2 continued to experience a host of symptoms after the acute phase of the infection. And then terms were born such as long COVID, long haulers, um, PASC. And for this presentation and our work, we refer to these ongoing symptoms as long COVID. So our purpose became to estimate the risk of long COVID for the Global Burden of Disease Study, which is uh, one of the largest research projects at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation that quantifies health loss in the world due to every disease. For uh, our long COVID definition, we used the WHO clinical case definition that they developed, which is newly onset or persisting symptoms three months after an acute episode of COVID-19, which importantly impact daily functioning and were not pre-existing symptoms before the infection. So these are symptoms due to the infection that impact daily life. Um, and we published our results in JAMA in October of last year. The data that went into our analysis started with a traditional systematic literature review. And we quickly realized uh, that the yield was extremely low uh, for quality studies and that each of these studies had a different symptom list that they were reporting on with well over 50 total symptoms mentioned. And they tended to report on the prevalence of individual symptoms that follow up or counts of symptoms. You know, this many people had three symptoms, this many had four, um, but without detailed information about the severity of these symptoms or overlap. So for our work, we needed more detail. And so we sought out collaboration with ongoing cohort study authors around the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. From the systematic literature review, we were able to utilize uh, 44 cohort studies. And I mentioned the limitations of those data already. Uh, we also made use of two administrative data sets, uh, a private claims database in the US and veterans affairs data in the US as well. And we extracted data based on ICD-10 symptom codes from those data. And then importantly, and very useful for us, is we uh, connected with 10 ongoing cohort studies in 10 different countries with individual level record data that they, uh, that they shared with us and worked with us to, um, to extract from. And so because we were working with the data directly, we were able to quantify the frequency, yes, and the overlap of disabling symptom clusters. And because different cohort studies use different questionnaires and different symptom scales, uh, we developed algorithms to make the extracted quantities as comparable as possible across these different scales and instruments. Based on all of these available data, when we looked at the symptoms that were being reported more commonly that were impacting daily functioning, we chose three common symptom clusters that tended to affect a large proportion of patients. And these were respiratory symptoms, uh, primarily characterized by shortness of breath, and fatigue with bodily pain and mood swings, and then cognitive symptoms like brain fog, memory loss, loss of concentration. So it's important to note here that we did not include the increased risk of diseases that are measured for us elsewhere within the global burden of disease study, uh, like increased risk of myocarditis or stroke or kidney disease, diabetes, 
um, we focused primarily on these long-term symptoms that could not be otherwise, otherwise classified. We assumed that asymptomatic infection does not lead to long COVID. And we based that on the, the couple of hundred asymptomatic infections that we did have follow-up data for. And the long COVID cases were very, very low and it was difficult to have confidence that those were due to the asymptomatic infection. So I think as new data come out that follow up asymptomatic infection, we'll, we're open to re-exploring um, the validity of that assumption, but that's, that's what we're working with right now due to lack of convincing data otherwise. For our estimates, we created separate estimates of the risk of long COVID in those that were not hospitalized, that had milder or moderate infections, and those who were hospitalized or in the ICU. And we have separate estimates by sex. We also happily had enough data to make separate estimates for children and young people under 20 among non-hospitalized cases. So we had uh, over 13,000 um, cases of COVID-19 that were followed up in a few countries to make those estimates. What we found is that the highest risk of having at least one of these symptom clusters at three months after infection was in women. About one in 10 women over age 20 um, had at least one of these symptom clusters. And about half that risk was among males. And then about half that risk was among children and young people, about one in 40 under age 20. And uh, this is, among cases from earlier in the pandemic. So now we're into 2023, but this, most of the follow-up data that we have are from cases of COVID-19 that occurred in 2020 and 2021. So these are earlier variants in the pandemic um, and very high risk. This is three months out from infection, about 10% in women. In terms of numbers globally, uh, if we apply those risks to the number of symptomatic infections that are estimated around the world, then we estimate that from infections occurring in 2020 and 2021 before Omicron, about 145 million new cases of long COVID occurred. And that's these three symptom clusters three months out. The vast majority of those long COVID cases are from non-hospitalized cases of COVID-19. So even though hospitalized patients had higher risk of long COVID three months out, because there were many more cases of non-hospitalized COVID-19, that leads to the much higher number of long COVID cases. About Because of the higher risk among females, about two thirds of these cases are women, females, and most of the cases are from 2021. In terms of the longer term follow-up, uh, we estimated based on the handful of studies that had longer follow-up a year out, that about 15% of those who had long COVID at three months continued to have at least one symptom cluster at 12 months. So the majority of cases tended to resolve in terms of these symptom clusters, but we're not sure yet how many of these cases become chronic and we need data with longer follow-up. Um, another thing to note, especially among these hospitalized patients on the bottom, you can see the, the great heterogeneity of the data sources. So there's a lot of uncertainty around our estimates um, appropriately, but, uh, but more data in future and longer follow-up will hopefully give us a clearer picture of the recovery pattern. We have preliminary estimates for 2022 for uh, you know, the majority of the cases were Omicron. And based on a study out of the UK uh, that compared Omicron to Delta, 
cases, the risk of long COVID, um, we're thinking that the risk among Omicron is about a third the risk of previous variants. And so based on that, um, about 100 million new cases of long COVID is estimated uh, occurring in 2022, which is similar to the number of cases in 2021, even with a lower risk, because there were so many more cases of Omicron occurring in 2022 that led to a similar number of new cases of long COVID. Our work has limitations. I mentioned the sparse heterogeneous data, especially at the tail of the recovery pattern, the longer follow-up time. Um, and we do not include increased risk of other diseases. We do not include the entire list of, of reported symptoms coming out, um, like headache, insomnia, GI issues. Uh, but we do, when we did look at other symptoms that were reported in our most detailed cohort, we found that these three symptom clusters did cover the majority of people who reported that they had not yet recovered from COVID-19. And so we do believe that these three symptom clusters cover the majority of long COVID patients, um, but not every single one of them. It is an underestimate. And we have relative, we do have some, but we have relatively few studies from low and middle income countries. And so we do see that wherever long COVID is studied, it's present, um, but there may be geographic variation that we can't currently estimate or glean from the data because of the data sparsity. In summary, there is considerable risk of ongoing symptoms after SARS-CoV-2 infection, with the highest risk in females. The majority of cases are in people of working age and caregivers, because that's where the most infections are. And so this really impacts um, work and education, teachers, caregivers um, in the world. And the majority of those with long COVID at three months do resolve by a year, but still about 15% are still a long COVID case at 12 months, which is not small. And the average severity of long COVID impacts daily functioning. We estimate that the, the average severity of these three symptom clusters um, is similar to that for long-term effects from traumatic brain injury. The large number of cases of long COVID um, you know, need recognition among primary care doctors, among um, just the healthcare systems, and they need rehab and supportive care uh, because they, in order to, to return to the workforce and to you know, school and um, to be able to take care of the children, um, they need rehab, especially for the cases that aren't resolving on their own. We do know that based on the recovery patterns in the data that we see, the average duration is shorter among non-hospitalized infections than in those that were hospitalized or in the ICU. COVID-19 is not the only infectious disease with long-term symptoms. Um, Others are reported for SARS-CoV-1, dengue, Q fever, and, and many other mostly viral infections. And so our hope is that the current focus on long COVID will trigger more research and more understanding of the mechanisms of all of these long-term outcomes of infections. And that can eventually benefit a much larger patient population beyond those with long COVID. The risk we're seeing right so far among the Omicron infections is smaller than previous variants, um, but it still concerns a lot of people. The next step, the next steps for us, uh, we are currently in the process of updating our data inputs, and we will be updating our estimates later in 2023 and probably into 2024. So we're doing 
an update of the systematic literature review and reaching out to more uh, cohorts to collaborate directly with, since that's really where we get the richness of data to work with. So we're most curious about estimating longer follow-up time of the early variants and more detailed follow-up of Omicron cases. And we're also going to explore adding in some other symptoms, like trying to capture that last bit of long COVID patients that aren't covered by these three symptom clusters, but are impacted, their daily functioning is impacted by their long COVID. Long COVID is interesting because it has an episodic nature in some of its symptoms that is really difficult to account for. Um, some symptoms wax and wane and others may appear eight months out. Um, and so, so I think that will be important to characterize and difficult to characterize. We also want to look at the impact of immunity both from vaccination and from reinfection. That'll impact the, the follow-up time. You know, if we were following people for 12 months, 18 months out, they may be reinfected within that time. And so accounting for that within our estimates will be really important. We're also going to, as I mentioned earlier, reevaluate our assumption of no long COVID risk among asymptomatic infections and see if there are data now to um, to allow for estimating that risk or if it's uh, still not convincing. Thank you for your time and I look forward to the discussion.